we've arrived finally at our uh, keynote for the evening. It's indeed evening where On is. So I'll just introduce him real quick. And then, uh, and then after that, we'll have a discussion where we will be joined by our panelists and also Reinhold Martin, who has now rejoined us, uh, who will join us in doing a um, roundup. So On Barak is a social and cultural historian of science and technology in non-Western settings. He's written three books. Uh, the first it was On Time, Technology and Temporality in Modern Egypt. Um, actually, that was the second. The first, one, uh, the first was Names Without Faces from Polemics to Flirtation in an Islamic chat room. And the mo most recent, which is titled Powering Empire, How Cold Made the Middle East and Sparked Global Carbonization. So On is a um, associate professor at the Department of Middle Eastern and African History at Tel Aviv University. He's been an extremely generous interlocutor for me and for many others in architecture. And that generosity includes being able to know when to listen to other fields and when not. And it's a great pleasure to have him um, conclude our today's conference. So Owen, if you're ready, um, please um, join us. Yes, so let me share my screen. And in the meantime, uh, thank you, Lucia. Uh, where is it? Here. Uh, yeah, so thank you, Lucia, and thank you, Forrest, and thank you, everybody for this really stimulating conversation. And uh, Lucia, you will get your Egyptian time because I was allotted 30 minutes, but I will speak something like 35. So let's call it 30 minutes Egyptian time. And uh, uh, for those of you who don't get the joke, I hope it will become clearer as I go on. Uh, I will talk today about the connection of concrete failure and fossil fuels. My spiel focuses on coal as an input in concrete, concrete production, which hopefully pushes our discussion of concrete beyond its singular materiality towards broader energetic and environmental contexts. And also because very much like concrete, coal embodies the tension between fuel or energy on the one hand and fossil or stone on the other. Now, um, as far as I know, the first reinforced concrete structure built in the Middle East, and we have a circular economy here because uh, we're kind of closing the circle from where Nimrod took us off, uh, is this structure, it's uh, this lighthouse built in Port Said, uh, which was then in Ottoman Egypt. Port Said, of course, is the town in the Mediterranean mouth of the Suez Canal. It was completed just one week before the festive inauguration of the canal in August 1869. Here we see the canal. Uh, the canal, of course, was an engineering wonder. Uh, it was based on the largest concentration of mechanical energy in history. Um, and it was an acceleration track for global carbonization. Uh, at least this is how I call it, the reversal of decarbonization, the worldwide proliferation of fossil fuels. Now, as a man-made channel, it shares much with the man-made stone that concerns us today. Both are achievements of modernity, which the horizon of climate collapse colors in a less flattering light. Uh, this was uh, true uh, when this talk was supposed to be delivered last month, uh, but uh, it actually goes uh, way beyond the recent blockage of the canal. Uh, actually, the ever given incident throws into sharper relief how things worked in the 19th century. You know, we tend to think of the canal as a single static object, but it was always a moving target. The narrow waterway created a bottleneck through which tacking or zigzagging sail, sail ships could not pass without colliding against the banks. And this promoted a shift, of, a shift to steamers, first to side, side wheelers, which again damaged themselves against the banks and consequently to ships with rear propellers. So uh, the canal and the ship or the infrastructure and the transportation technology created one another in a feedback cycle. The shift to liners, to steamers sailing in straight lines also promoted point to point navigation and therefore the construction of more lighthouses, more reinforced concrete and so on and so forth. So lighthouses help elucidate the importance of concrete, a substance, a substance quickly setting or, or quickly solidifying and therefore very appropriate for building near or in aquatic environments as an infrastructure for global carbonization. Port Said, for example, did not have 
in its vicinity stone quarries. It was easier and cheaper to transport cement and steel. By the way, I learned from Lucia and Forrest's article that when Hamada developed his carbonation equation, he relied on experiments in different buildings, including the Takao, the Takao, the Takao Lighthouse near, Ta near Taipei, another lighthouse built in the 1860s or 1870s. At any rate, the Port Said Lighthouse guides our path spatially and temporally. Spatially it draws attention to the maritime aspects of the spread of coal and concrete, a process usually associated with land. From the sea, we'll proceed to the liminal space of the coast and only then to the interior. And temporally, the 1869 lighthouse allows pushing backwards concrete story, which we usually begin half a century later. So this allows retracing the joint spread of coal and concrete to begin the story of beyond concrete uh, in a point before concrete and to kind of enter the Anthropocene, not in the usual uh, acceleration of the hockey sticks uh, after 1945, but uh, in the second industrial revolution. Um, and it also allows attending to time itself, the time of coal and the time of concrete in the Anthropocene. So I have four points and uh, this is the first one. Discussions of fossil fuels usually assume a rupture with previous driving forces, what is called energy transition, and especially a rupture with muscle energy and human labor. Coal-fired steam engines were assumed to be labor-saving devices. So the steamers passing through the canal, for example, did not require the ample manpower of sailors climbing up and down masts to operate an elaborate system of sails in, in wind-powered vessels. Of course, they did rely on firemen, stokers, coal heavers, and many, many coal miners, but these workers were less visible. They were underground or in the bellies of uh, engine rooms uh, and less visible and thus easier to ignore. And there was also a new split between extracting the energy and deploying it. This is also true for concrete making and the coal-fired dredgers, uh, which we see here, built to dig the Suez Canal, to build its embankments, to reclaim land, and also for making concrete blocks are a good case in point. These machines were documented with the relatively new technology of photography in the 19th century in images such as these ones sold in world fairs, almost always without people, or at least without the Egyptian workers that worked on or near them. This stripping away of the human from the technological is surely one way of broadening the discussion of concrete towards energy, the energy of labor power, but it is a more general theme and I will revisit it later. And we, we, many of us already touched on it uh, before. At any rate, missing from these images and from most stories about the canal are the thousands of corvée laborers who died digging the canal and were buried where they fell, becoming parts of the banks. Uh, maybe like in these mafia stories about building concrete bridges in New York City. Uh, this invisible dead labor that is not reducible to capital is a feature, not a bug of fossil fuel mechanization. Man-made things evaporating the human element of making them was what coal-fired steam engines did regularly. Man-made waterways, man-made stones, even man-made ice with uh, coal-fired ice makers the ice used to resuscitate from heat stroke, workers fainting in the engine rooms of steamers passing, in the canal, passing through the canal in August when temperatures could reach as high as 70 degrees Celsius in the boiler room, all suggest that concrete was a symptom of coal's ability to quickly transform states of matter. So before we attend to the synergy of coal and concrete, it is important to remember that this nexus depended on other older kinds of power, uh, and these kinds of power were often intensified, not surpassed or made redundant. So this was the first point. And the second point uh, now attends to this synergy. Uh, Lucia and Forrest identify a critical feedback cycle, and I quote, concrete carbonation and the rise in the Earth's temperature influence each other reciprocally. Today, the concrete construction industry contributes approximately five to 8% of anthropogenic CO2 emissions. Thus, the factor K is dynamic 
in part because it is affected by the change in the nature of the atmosphere, including the change provoked by all of the accumulated uh, concrete production around the world since 1900. Obviously, most of this emitted CO2 comes from something not directly mentioned, the combustion of fossil fuels. And I wonder if the numbers include sand extraction and met metal manufacturing, uh, both also depending on coal and then on oil. Historically, the expansion of the metal industry after the mechanization, after its mechanization in the second half of the 19th century, and the related introduction of coal power was a precondition for the popularization of reinforced concrete. But if coal was a precondition for concrete, we seem to have a chicken and egg situation here because if we go back to the sea and to the lighthouses, we realize that before coal could become an available energy source for the local production of concrete, concrete itself was essential in making the infrastructures for shipping coal from the British Isles and elsewhere in Western Europe to the colonies. And in the 20th century, for the infrastructures for shipping oil, for, for shipping oil in the other direction. In the 19th century, the steamship was seen as a railway without a track, a means of transportation requiring frequent stops, about once per week roughly, unlike sailboats, which could stay long periods in the open sea. Reinforced concrete facilitated the industrialization of the sea, the carbonization that would in turn bring about its own carbonation. And uh, what we see here uh, are uh, maps of lighthouses in leaps of uh, two centuries each. So the 1850s, the 1870s, the 1890s, and 1914. Uh, such infrastructures, calling depots, deep water harbors, customs houses, these lighthouses, the Suez Canal, you name it. In short, the localization or the making local of concrete production, a key feature in what made reinforced concrete a standard building technique of the 20th century, required the proliferation of its energy source, coal, and vice versa. So to make my intervention here clear, if Lucia and Forrest give us an atmospheric perspective, an accumulative one, I am trying to complement it with a historical perspective and a maritime one. And indeed, this is how the, the hydrocarbon economy uh, is represented in the 1860s. Um, this is a, a famous uh, thematic cartography produced by Charles Joseph Minard the father of, or the grandfather of infographics, uh, stressing, so, 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 so much stressing the maritime nature of the, the proliferation of this fossil fuel that he has to make these choices like expanding the Straits of Gibraltar uh, beyond recognition. Okay, so to my third point. The boom town of Port Said, a city newly built in a place devoid of agriculture or drinkable water, offers a good example to the two previous points, the reliance of coal-based infrastructures on human labor, of those building and later operating the canal, and of the synergy of coal and concrete along the nodes of the system. And it exemplifies also a third project, a, 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 another process, a third point, the rapid urbanization in coastal plains made possible by the wedding, by the synergy of these powers, human labor, coal, concrete, and several other things like sand. One of the characteristics of global carbonization was the expansion of existing port cities like Alexandria, Jaffa, or Beirut, to talk about my own neighborhood, and the emergence of new ones like Port Said or Tel Aviv. All these new urban centers were connected, new or, or vastly expanded urban centers were connected via steamer lines, coaling stations, lighthouses, etc to the network of global trade and transportation, as well as to other port cities uh, and to interiors, uh, gradually via railways and roads that are increasingly made from concrete, uh, connecting them to cities like Cairo, Damascus, Jerusalem. Now, Palestinian historian Salim Tamari noticed an interesting phenomenon. Until the second half of the 19th century, Levantine, especially Palestinian coastal towns, turned their backs to the sea. They allocated separate mosques to sailors, feared sea breeze, and built their houses so that windows and doors turned to the east. And of course, they were surrounded by walls and fortifications meant to repel human and non-human invasions from the sea. Until the 20th century, most of the region's population was not concentrated along the coast, 
but this is changing rapidly uh, here in, in the Middle East and globally as Amitav Ghosh noticed. Uh, so uh, this is a quote from uh, the Great Derangement. I will let you read it. Um, but uh, the crux of it is that before modernity, people feared the sea after it, they started considering it as prime real estate. Concrete marriage to coal and oil is an important driver of this process. And Tel Aviv, from which I'm broadcasting, is a good example. The so-called white city, and Nimrod also kind of prepared the ground here. The so-called white city was one of the first places in Palestine where enforced concrete was used in mass. And uh, actually the silicate bricks built between the concrete columns and covered in white plasters were what gave the city its nickname. Whereas the lighthouses and maritime environments I alluded to earlier uh, were places reinforced concrete did not push for the adoption of new building styles. In coastal cities, this, this certainly was the case. White porches, corners without columns, strip windows hugging the corner without being interrupted by a, by a column, etc. Now, this is not so not true at all for Tel Aviv, but certainly true for several of its uh, northern and southern neighbors like Beirut and Alexandria. Uh, the process there was pushed by a bombardment from the sea, uh, from steamships, uh, bombardments that initiated or ignited the deforest, a defortification process. But even when stones of old walls were turned to promenades and cornices, they were supplanted with concrete, uh, which was also used for breakwaters and wave dissipating blocks. These made docking as well as sea bathing easier. And as a side note, in the context of concrete energetics, it is interesting to mention this feature of uh, absorbing the power of external flows like waves or, or storms, which is evident in many, many other structures. So uh, uh, the, the Jaffa Customs House, a famous international style building built in the 1930s uh, and comes to mind. Uh, it was built exactly to repel these kinds of uh, storms and waves from hitting uh, the city. At any rate, taller sea facing concrete buildings were part of a new infatuation with the sea, evident in poetry, painting, even a trend of interior wall and ceiling painting of seascapes, uh, even in older houses. Uh, I have another one. Uh, but the main symptom of this new culture was seagoing and the development of a beach culture, the discovery of the beach, as it were. The new tension, a new tension is born in this moment between two attitudes to sea sand. One is commodifying it as a key input for concrete manufacturing, including the idea that concrete would fulfill the modernist idea of a sand and dust-free city, the kind of Corbusierian city, and turn said sand from a problem to a solution by absorbing it into roads and walls. The other ideal or the other stand sees sand, sees sand, sees sand as the soft layer of the beach, uh, and later as a depleting substance in need of protection from these very extractive impulses. Tel Aviv, the city that, springs, that sprang from the sands, emblematizes the Zionist ideal of clading the Holy Land with a dress of concrete and cement, as a famous poem puts it. Now, the person who brought these materials to the city uh, after Weiss, uh, in fact, which Nimrod uh, uh, presented to us, was Meyer Dizengoff, the first mayor who had a business of importing Portland cement, who founded a company for paving roads and salvaging land, who inaugurated the first Jewish seaport, and who was also involved in importing automobiles. He thus personally exemplifies the connection of fossil fuels and concrete. And methodologically, uh, retracing this nexus might go through following such careers. The fossil fuels and concrete driven turn to the sea, including the carbon footprint of daily commutes to these coastal cities uh, on concrete roads from interiors, the resulting sea level rise, sea acidification, the salination of aquifers, the collapse of the Nile Delta, the damage to agriculture and fisheries, the depletion of sand, among many other environmental repercussions, 
make it clear that the process has the process of carbonization had other consequences for the world and even for concrete structures way beyond concrete carbonation. Okay, and I come to my uh, fourth and last point. If what I've said so far was meant to rethink concrete in a broader ecology of materials, flows, and energy sources, I want to take another step in this direction and suggest that perhaps also the temporality of concrete and the question of its durability or failure, the time oscillating between eternity and the century is not singular to concrete, but rather is informed by this broader ecology of which it is part. Now, we tend to think about the connection between deep geological time and human history and also human science on a diachronical level, a level in which the human historical time is small scale and recent, and it is a time standing on the broad shoulders of the macro time or the macro temporality uh, of deep or ancient time. Viewed like this, Hamada's equation reveals a category error. error. Uh, we thought concrete belonged to the latter, the latter temporality, but in fact, it is historical, man-made, ephemeral. But while this might very well be true, I want to suggest another perspective, a synchronic one, stemming from my thinking about the temporality of coal. To do this, we can go back to 19th century Egypt, and we will, but there is a better point of departure, especially in this crowd of an architectural school. Uh, Louis Mumford's famous statements from uh, Techniques and Civilization, the clock, not the steam engine, is the key machine of the modern industrial age, which I actually want to put on its head. And uh, to, do this, to do this, we can start uh, again with a very famous point of departure, uh, the, the kind of most prominent historical discussion of modern clock discipline. Uh, before steam power spread in the British Isles, the protagonists of E.P. Thompson's 1967 article on, clock di on time discipline could assert their agency about clock time in the, in the 1820s and 1830s in water wheel powered mills, but far less so under coal. For these laborers, the clock was a means to fight their employers and insist on implementing the agreed upon time is money equation. This was because the fluctuations and irregularities of water power created tensions and labor unrest. When the river was high, workers were forced to stay at water wheel powered mills beyond the mandatory 12 hour workday. But steam engines offered capitalists a crucial advantage in these struggles. By the year 1830, these machines were mobile enough to compete with water power which had bound production to riverbanks. Mobile generators and portable fuels allowed mills to be moved to urban centers where workers were abundant and thus replaceable. So against the ebbs and flows of water and work time, the regularity of steam power afforded better exploitation of human work. In the following decades, employers in, Euro in Europe's periphery, in cotton mills in colonial Bombay, and in, in the silk sector in Ottoman Bursa, for example, similarly often chose to ignore the clock in their steam mills, whereas workers on their part fought for more regular clock time shifts, but now often in vain. Steam engines trumped clocks and informed whether, where, and how time discipline would be imposed. And as we will now see, also what mechanical time actually meant in different places. So uh, let us examine now the introduction of clock time into the Middle East and its relationship to global carbonization. In the year 1870, the first timetables were published in the Egyptian state railways, a process that went along with the centralization of calling in the railway. The introduction of railway timetables was a consequence of an event a year, late, a year earlier with which we're already familiar, the shift of the British India traffic to the Suez Canal after the canal's inauguration in 1869. As a competitor to the canal, the railway connecting Cairo, Alexandria, and Port Said had to look for ways to reduce costs and increase efficiency. One of the first targets was coaling, the largest item in a railway bill, especially in a place like Egypt, where fossil fuel was imported at great cost. Until 1870, the different sections of the Egyptian railway operated independently, both technically and administratively. 
This did not allow centralized, reg re centralized registration of coal expenditure or a timetable for the entire railway due to congestions that disrupted planning and because human coaling labor was harder to control and synchronize. Now, a locomotive consumed in the 19th century as much as, as one-tenth of its daily fuel supply simply hitting itself to the point that it could produce steam to carry its own weight. Therefore, the steam engine combined thrift in time and coal. The train that lingered in different stations wasted more time and more coal than the train that did not wait. Setting fixed times for passenger pickup drew its logic from this new and synergic nexus of time and fuel. Yet the centralization of yet if the centralization of coal of coaling and the introduction of uh, unified timetables were interdependent, both these processes could be articulated in multiple ways, and not only in the forms that were standardized in Europe. Uh, and, and this was partly because that as long as passengers and goods waited in stations rather than trains waiting for them, delays hardly mattered. In both Europe and the Middle East, the interest of the public, I quote, in regularity, speed, safety, and economy often contradicted the financial goals of railway companies, um, end of quote. And if this was the case in the quoted parliamentary, British parliamentary report from 1872, a year later, when the coal industry brought about a global Great Depression, railway companies were forced to prioritize coal thrift over the public interest uh, in many uh, places and in many fashions. In Egypt, things were much worse. Under a new debt payment regime, resulting from the need to repay building the Suez Canal, the railway was forced to hand over most of its revenue, leaving very little for working expenses. It was also subjected to, in, to an international board of directors, making it very difficult to manage. All these caused frequent delays. Delays were directly related to coal saving policies. There were economic reasons for keeping a schedule, but not necessarily keeping to it. Engineers argued that laxer efficiency and punctuality standards should apply in a railway whose, I quote, employees are drawn from the uncivilized population in which years of training must be devoted before they become competent workmen who realize what efficiency mean, means. In such a colonial railway, the company would continue to employ cheap labor and shut its eyes to failures and delays until its passengers, its passengers clamored for better service, end of quote. Now, this hierarchy is quite familiar. European modernity was shot through with a temporal hierarchy that arranged different peoples and civilizations along the developmentalist or evolutionary time arrow where the British, the British gentleman was the paragon of creation. What I'm trying to clarify here is how this Orientalist notion of historical time was translated into timetables and clocks and greatly invigorated under steam, which gave it a new lease on life in the modern era and vice versa, how minutes and hours were synchronized or asynchronized with notions of historical time. The resulting Egyptian time uh, was first resisted by Egyptian passengers who were comparing their railway performance standards to what they saw in Europe. But in time, Egyptians started finding benefits in the fact that unlike the alienated impersonal and rigid temporal standards in industrial Europe, their time was more attuned to interpersonal relationships and laxer. And they began to take pride in the fact that the modernist and capitalist fascination with speed and punctuality was tempered in Egypt by an appreciation of slowness and asynchrony. Lola, this is for you. In many of these critiques, time was not money and even the fossil fuels that animate the time should not be monetized or subjected to the logic of the market. In the canal or the railway or in coal mines in, um, in the Ottoman Empire, uh, people rejected the stripping off of the human element from technology or from natural resources. What I just demonstrated for the railway is applicable also for other coal-fired technologies, telegraphs, telephones, tramways, and also to other forms of temporality. So not only punctuality, but also synchronicity and speed. The differential nature of time manifested itself 
uh, on different temporal scales. Exactly what excused operating a railway with more lenient standards of punctuality was the position of Egypt in a slower and earlier stage of development on a time arrow whose tip was Western Europe. The colonial encounter created a spectrum of punctualities and speeds that made Egypt lax and lethargic in contrast to the punctual and swift British Isles. This was a worldview accepted not only in the global north, but also in the global south. Middle Easterners bought into it just as much as Europeans did. So in a nutshell, coal fossilized 19th century and earlier racial and orientalist cultural and until then ephemeral notions of time and made them durable as principles of machine operation. Sorry. Nowadays, nowadays we tend to consider the time of coal, not with clocks, but in terms of deep geological time captured in the notion the Anthropocene. We usually think of this relationship in terms of emissions from coal, from coal combustion deposited uh, in the atmosphere as greenhouse gas, and through the effects of these emissions like concrete carbonation. But it is important to also note the centrality of the underground and of coal and coal searches in the history that produces this framework, the Anthropocene. Um, while well, the history of geology and stratigraphy, the division of the earth into distinct layers corresponding to different geological epochs is not exclusively a story of coal. This mineral is absolutely central to the development and spread of this epistemology in the 19th century and onwards when doing stratigraphy was above all yoked to the purpose of mapping the underground for finding the first fossil fuel, the first fossil fuel. The term Anthropocene, the time or epoch of the Anthropos, when humanity became a geological force, supposes a homogeneity of an abstract humanity. Indeed, the many critiques of the term usually revolve around the problem of the decontextualized or depoliticized Anthropos, the fact that blaming all of humanity in the abstract for climate collapse effaces the much greater responsibility of capitalists, Westerners, plantation owners, Christians, men or fill in the blank. Far less attention is given to the suffix scene, Greek, uh, time in Greek, and to the temporal dimension of the Anthropocene framework. Yet alongside the abstract presentless time of Western geology, there existed other ways of conceptualizing deep time. So to revisit our Ottoman Egyptians uh, and their alternative or even counter tempos once again, in translations of French and British stratigraphy, into Arabic and Ottoman Turkish, these people associated stratigraphy with the notion of tabakat or generations of Islamic scholars and thus with intergenerational responsibility. Again, celebrating a time anchored in interpersonal, interpersonal relationships uh, and they saw coal as a divine deposit, as a gift of God, as a gift of God to, the, to be distributed to the communities uh, pious or poor. Ottoman stratigraphy inflects deep time, pluralizes the Anthropocene, and opens up Dipesh Chakrabarti's question, which Lucia and Forrest repeat, of connecting historical and planetary time, if not reproducing his answer. In fact, Ottoman temporalities offer an alternative way of thinking about the transformation of humans into a geological force. So how should we think together the measurable time of minutes and hours, the time of centuries of human history or concrete failure, and the deep time of geology? This task is critical not only because we suddenly realize that geological time bursts into our own history and present, but also because the emergence of humanity as a geological force manifests itself in terms of speed. By becoming a geological force, Humanity accelerated and, in a sense, humanized geological time. Geological processes no longer require mil millions of years to slowly unfold, but can take place in a few decades. By the way, geology itself shifted in the process from what was called uniformitarianism, the notion that nature does not make leaps, to gradually include elements of what was once called catastrophism. We are the biblical deluge, as it were. And what better example of this than concrete? 
in which humans accelerated processes of rock formation and are suddenly discovering the relative ephemerality of their man-made rocks. David Wallace Wells recently half joked in The Uninhabitable Earth that we emitted more greenhouse gases since the airing of Seinfeld than in all prior history. This was, this was long after the scientific consensus shown clearly through the screens erected by the merchants of doubt. We know very well what we're doing. Yet the urgency that should result from this realization is differentially distributed across the globe. And I want to suggest that this too has much to do with the history of carbonization and its hierarchical temporalities. The gap between awareness and action on a global scale is related to the way decarbonization entered geopolitics, informed by claims from countries in the global south that they have the right to catch up with the post-industrialized global north before carbon neutrality can be discussed or reached. For example, rather than calling for a global redistribu redistribution, of existing, redistribution of existing resources. This is the very developmentalist time arrow forged in the 19th century and in the process of carbonization. But as we have seen, the 19th century was also a time when alternative ways for thinking about time, both quotidian and deep, emerged. So what if along with thinking of humanity as a geological force, we deploy such humanized temporalities and humanized energetics and start thinking the nature start thinking of nature or geology as saturated with human ethics, with interpersonal care, with intergenerational responsibility, and the list can probably include uh, Felix, Felix's beauty uh, or love. Uh, but if we realize that we are still in history, in some respects still in the age of coal and even in the 19th century, that we never stop being modern, but that the key technologies and energies that birthed the modern world animated standardization, but also flexibilization, the logics of the market that renders energy, in energy and matter into flows of capital through say energy as GDP or cap and trade policies, but also gave rise to sources of resistance to these logics. So uh, these are just some of the questions that starting before concrete help in going after it and um, I look forward to your um, questions. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, On. That was an incredible journey where we stopped every so often to fuel up on historical narratives. I'm struck by your taking on Lewis Mumford. I've been known to do that myself. Um, and, and really questioning what it, where it is that we locate the technological in architecture. Because by saying it's not the clock, it's not the steamship, it's the clock, he means to go against, he means to point to a more abstract form, to, he means to elevate um, his discourse. And of course you point out that that abstraction is in no way um, distinct from resource extraction. So um, for this final discussion, um, I mean, I have tons of questions, but I will, uh, Instead, introduce our, um, my colleague, Reinhold Martin, who is a professor of architecture at GSAP, as well as the director of the Buell Center and the director of several other things. Um, uh, and he has very kindly agreed to join us for the final discussion. Uh, we've asked him to um, direct some larger thematic questions for um, let's say 10 minutes or so, make some remarks and then to, and then Forrest and I will join back in after 10 minutes to help him and all of us, all of us panelists to uh, have a you know concluding discussion, concluding of course, just for this event, but then um, many more conversations to come. So I'll, Ryan just, I'll just add informally, since I've been informally introducing everybody that really arriving seven years ago now into the architectural world, uh, Reinhold was my initiation into what the Anthropocene means in architecture, I think at a conference, I think this was a while ago. So. I'm actually very excited to have you here because I've since then appreciated uh, very much so how we talk about the Anthropocene in, in architecture. So thanks for joining us. Thanks. I, I, sorry about that, Forrest. I didn't <laughs> know that, that that was true, but here we are. Yes. Well, for, well, thank you for the opportunity. And, and I want to, I think on behalf of uh, everybody here on the screen and wherever we all are, in our networks to thank Anne Barak for this wonderful 
concluding uh, yes. talk, and the, and 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 the, I, you know, basically thought that we could we could pick up some of the conversations that you all have begun. I apologize for having to to step away for a PhD exam midstream, but caught many of the conversations and and to connect a few dots. And I, I wanted to do that by going back to the beginning um, of Alm's talk to the Suez Canal and to see if there's something, there are some other things there. And I'm just, just I'm really honestly just curious what you think uh, that, that we could pursue um, uh, to help connect. One is to think about how we think about materials to begin with, whoever that we is, whether we are uh, our, our scholars of architecture, our practitioners, engineers, et cetera, the, the, the group that's here, or others um, who might be joining in this conversation. Um, one, the suggestions that have been made throughout, and I think you just demonstrated, I think very, very elegantly, um, uh, in a sense, how to do this in four points, um, is, is to think materials relationally, we could say ecologically, uh, in, in the sense as, 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 as belonging to, and to some extent constituted through their relations with other processes, forces, beings. Uh, I'm thinking also about uh, Sophia's uh, brilliant kind of intervention earlier uh, on the eco internal ecosystem that is concrete. And so I, I, to, to return to that inter ecosystem, Forrest and, and Lucia, I think Forrest, you showed very early on, um, you showed the, the section of a reinforced concrete something with the steel bar at, to, and the steel rebar in there to show how decarbonization, how carbonation works. Um, and so this is where we go back to, to Suez. One of the other, you mentioned this in your talk also on that, that the, one of the other uses of concrete in the canal was as, as to make blocks for, for jetties and breakwaters and so on. Um, those blocks, as I presume, I, I don't know for sure, I presume were not reinforced, uh, which is one of the reasons they, would, they could go in the water uh, because you wouldn't have the steel you know, exposed in one way or the other. And, um, but the steel nonetheless becomes a kind of limiting and both defining factor for a couple of presenters along the way said, well, you know, when I mean, con when I say concrete, I mean reinforced concrete. And then meanwhile, there were, there were I think Nimrod showed some exam examples of blocks. I, I know there are others, uh, Lola, I know works on this, uh, of, of masonry units, for example, that are made out of cement and aggregates, et cetera, that we would call concrete. So, so the, the steel element reminds us that this thing called concrete internally uh, is composite. Uh, and, and, and so I, I was wondering if we follow the steel, whether this takes us back to the clocks and the steam engines again, or, or we wind up somewhere else. Um, and, and the steel I had in mind in me initially was the Bartholdi uh, um, statue uh, of Egypt. Um, I think it's called Egypt bearing the light of Asia uh, that was proposed for the mouth of the Suez, but was never built in Port Said. Uh, but did wind up being built in, in a kind of modified form here in New York Harbor um, uh, as a Statue of Liberty. Uh, and, and the steel frame of that, uh, that structure and structures like it, the Eiffel Tower, et cetera, from this time period, from this period, this, and the, the, this, this sort of matrix of relations that, that you've laid out, um, live on in, in, in the different cultures, the, the design cultures and the, and the, and the, and the intellectual um, communities that, that, that have come together here to discuss materials. Uh, and and they, they live on, but maybe a little bit differently. I'm using the metaphor, this vitalist metaphor, live on, et cetera, uh, kind of knowingly. Um, so I'm, I'm just, I'm kind of wondering if, if, if we, if we begin the discussion of concrete with the steel and, and recognize steel as itself a bearer of many of the contradictions, you know, as, as, as also belonging to the coal, uh, the age of coal that, that remains with us and so on and, 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 and kind of is haunted by these enfolded temporalities. Um, do we wind up any place different? Uh, uh, you know, it, it, do we need another conference or, or, or do we somehow uh, circle back to put it that way um, to where we've been all along. I don't know. So on, what do you think, Steel? I'm showing everybody the light. Yeah, yeah, there we are. This yeah. is the original statue originally intended for Port Said and eventually built in modified form right here um, in New York City. Yeah. 
Oh, Rhino, this is a, a, a wonderful question because um, one feature of, uh, of the process that I'm describing and actually one point of frustration for many Egyptians is that everything still comes from abroad and is assembled uh, in, in, in situ. So uh, if we start with this, if we start with the sea, with the steel, concrete is not a local material. Right. Uh, so and, and I think that makes a tremendous difference. Uh, and, and concrete has this character, uh, this, this character of, of being local, but being also Western, uh, requiring expertise from from Europe or elsewhere. So uh, it's kind of dual purpose uh, of, of being both local and not exactly has to do with its composite nature and and the uh, wedding of cement and steel uh, so so I think this is this is really uh, a way to inflect the conversation in in fascinating ways yeah I mean I guess I you know I had in mind also with the steamships the railroads all of which belong to this ecology of steel that as you showed it with concrete in turn, intersects with and depends upon the, the, the deep history of coal and its modern uh, you know, geographies um, in ways that, that to some extent do map onto one another, like you know, in, in what you said about the railroads, and in, and in other ways don't. And, and, and then to kind of bring it fast forward, because I don't remember offhand the numbers, as far as maybe you remember, like steel production contributes some quite comparable you know, degree of, of CO2 uh, these days. Uh, and for in the in the building economies that we're we're talking about uh, in contemporary cities, for example, you know, it, it had been the case, and I think it varies case to case, that labor costs, uh, you know, one very deterministic, but but I think probably not entirely inaccurate um, uh, reason or, or argument that's that's often cited for the for the predominance of concrete construction in the global south and in under conditions of so-called development, et cetera, is the, the availability of relatively inexpensive or cheaper, or, like, or even in the case of the canal corvée labor, um, whereas steel is made in factories and shipped and you know, the sort of division of labor operates differently uh, along its, the, the networks of steel. And, and in, in cities like New York, this was, for a long time, the re, you know the reason that was said, why is New York a city of steel skyscrapers? Well, you know, because of this division of labor. This has changed, and and even sometimes I, I appeal to the engineers here for a second. I've known or, or known of projects in which in which the material is changed, sort of midstream. They design a skyscraper initially to for 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 steel, then the the construction costs, labor costs, the, that equation between labor, material. And transportation, you know, changes, um, and and suddenly you have a, a steel building rather than a concrete one, or vice versa. Uh, the Trump Tower, by the way, is a is a concrete building, I believe, uh, even though it looks like you know it should be steel. So, um, so that economy, you know, that that exchangeability, I guess, was what I'm getting at. Also occurs under specific political, economic, you know, geographic situated sort of conditions. Um, what doesn't seem to change much is the carbon emissions. So I think this is where your point is, is taken again, that, that underneath or within and kind of in, in the seams of all of this uh, is the Anthropocene. Uh, so I, I don't know, I didn't want to uh, dwell too much on that, but, but it, it seemed, I don't know if anybody else has well, any- Reinhold, I was going to say, it's always struck to me that there's an economy of visibility in, yeah. and this is very local to the history of architecture, where the 19th century is supposed to have made steel eminently visible. It became this visible supplement to stone in the 19th century Beaux-Arts architecture of La Brousse, et cetera, yeah. and then gets subsumed, um, you know, and then gets sort of debated and shaped into forms which are supposed to be properly modern, let's say as opposed to concrete, whose story is that it was there all along masquerading as stone and only uh, and is revealed to have been modern all along or something like that, as opposed to steel's history, which is, or iron's, it's really metal, which is, uh, was trying to, uh, you know, show itself off 
as being a slight modification of Beaux-Arts architecture and had to be radically transformed by engineers, had to go outside of architecture in a sense. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. In fact, you know, what I had in mind with the, with the jetties and so on is that, you know, under those conditions, concrete, what is concrete? It's not stone. Like it, otherwise, if there was stone available, it would have been stone. Yes. So, whereas yeah. under this, in the skyscrapers, what is concrete? It's not steel. Yeah, yeah. And, I, I like very much and, owns, mm -hmm. um, bringing up of concrete already as a repair material. Uh, I mean, this goes also to Lola is like, couldn't you add a little bit of concrete? Yes, it, it was there all along and it didn't need to be featured heroically, even in the lighthouse, um, that it was there as an ingredient of repair from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but yeah. in the context of these long time scales we've arrived at now at the end, right? I think the feedback loops of the materials have come to the fore and things like steel now are mostly talked about in the context of what percentage of your steel is recycled when you start a project. And that ends up playing out in the dynamics of, of calculating what your decisions are in a strange and new way, I would argue today, like uh, particularly in the competition between new massive timber buildings versus steel versus concrete. Like there's a new player in the game and that's largely because the equations maybe have shifted slightly, though I would say not very precisely. And that lack of precision maybe comes from exactly where own sort of ended on this geological, like how do we bring in geological timescale impacts of what we represent, what you showed in the wonderful image at the end and what Felix showed at the beginning of all the curves of things that are changing rapidly, but like to us we're sitting here in the next 10 minutes, it's still not rapid enough to really bring into the equation that the person at the project site is calculating how much is this building going to cost over the next few years. And I think that time scale is the one that is yet to fold in effectively, I guess, to make those decisions between not just steel and concrete, but also just sort of bringing in the other externalities, many of which we, I think, had very good points made today about. Um, but I'm still at a loss to whether those complexities can really, <laughs> really come together. I, I, I have well, just one more quick question. I see Sophia has a question yeah. uh, as well. So we'll, I just, on the, on the time scale question for own, uh, and then, then we can go to Sophia. I just wanted to add, since this was a, um, you know, the, in terms of circling back to the beginning and, and clearly you, the three of you are in sync in terms of periodization, the hundred year time frame uh, is, is a meaningful one. But you did refer and others did too, to the, some, what's sometimes called the great acceleration uh, and other, you know, moments. Um, of, of, of change, of, of, of you know, a temporal change, temporal uh, speeding up, and maybe there are even slowing moments of slowing down that mean something to, to us, both historically and in terms of the urgencies of the present. So, is, is there something to be said? Uh, okay, if we go back to the to the hundred year time frame, about prioritizing that vis-a-vis -vis concrete, and and then uh, over the Great Acceleration, for example. Uh, or, or should these be seen um, in in some sort of rhythm uh, 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 or something like that? Yeah, I can I add to that? I'll just piggyback into that question for own. Uh, you see, your argument reminded me of, you know, arguments by historians of, uh, like Christophe Bonneuil's argument, for example, that we, that there's incredible hubris to calling the Anthropocene. And I mean, you've made this argument in print too, that that of naming a certain age as the human age, and that we should. Um, not resort to geological times, not resort to that, to two different temporalities, because it's uh, narcissistic. Uh, my sense is that in architecture, this has the effect, it's also narcissistic, of course, but uh, in a certain sense, allows architects to self-anthropologize and to, it's meant as a critical gesture that says, look at what you will build in you know, millennia, it will have this effect. Uh, so I think architecture considers itself a uniquely um, uh, sort of, uh, impactful discipline on the earth or something like that. So are you saying that we should not, are you recommending we don't um, refer to alternate, you know, let's say geological temporalities, or are you simply trying to rescue, let's say 19th century uh, temporalities such as the, the Ottoman time where, which is also 19th century, but more sociable or more attuned to, you know, social distortions? Yeah, so, so uh, to, to all of these questions, you know, the, um, Part of the literature on the Anthropocene is organized around a, a competition for the starting point, uh, the Industrial Revolution, uh, post-war, uh, 
the discovery of fire, the, the agricultural uh, revolution, you, you know, uh, you name it. Uh, but um, I think it's much more useful if the Anthropocene uh, or whatever we want to call it is a hyper object in Timothy Morton's uh, phrase, uh, then it's something that has multiple points of entry. Uh, and uh, it is not something that is uh, organized around a single beginning. Um, so I think that uh, I'm not trying to move away from uh, or to do away with uh, the, the time of geology. I'm trying to kind of critique it from within and inflect it from within and synchronize what is kind of uh, deemed purely diachronic uh, to show that there are various kind of inflections of deep time of geology. Uh, and, um, and, and I think also practically or politically, uh, this is now, you know, the Anthropocene is, is the only game in town. Or, uh, it, it doesn't make sense to replace it with the capital of scene or plantation of scene or, or whatever scene, uh, but, uh, but uh, rather uh, to pluralize it and to kind of absorb all of these things uh, inside it, uh, also as, as a way to kind of promote what, what you are doing, to kind of bridge between scientists, uh, even if they are geologists, and, uh, and humanists, or, uh, or people kind of thinking of, uh, of politics, and, and, and politics is a human thing. Uh, Fantastic, yeah. great. Great. Yes. <laughs> so, so Sophia had, a, had a, your hand up, I don't you there? Yeah, I, I, hi, so hi, hi. this has been tremendously fascinating. And um, one of the things I was thinking about following on On's talk is, um, uh, so a couple of uh, kind of uh, theories of temporality have been floating around uh, these conversations over the course of the day. I know Chakrabarty has been brought up a few times. And I was thinking about the way in which Chakrabarty talks about how, uh, you know, the Anthropocene is this moment in which humans have have intervened into or interpenetrated into geological history. And, and the um, he actually uses a geological metaphor in talking about this, right? So Chakrabarty says that uh, we've overcome this rifting or faulting between uh, human time and deep time. And I, I find this incredibly problematic because I don't think that there really was a rift uh, in the first place. But one of the things that I was thinking about uh, following on what On just said, is that perhaps a better model for this uh, relationship between uh, the time of human experience and the time of uh, geological uh, periodization or geological epics comes from uh, someone that Lucian Forrest cite, right? Reinhard, Reinhard, Reinhard Koselek, who talks about um, uh, what he calls stratigraphic time, you know, and, and the notion that um, natural history is something that gets interbedded with uh, human history, right? And, and so your reference of the, the hundred years as this moment in which we try to naturalize the century uh, as a unit um, seems seems important to that uh, issue as well, no? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, I think it speaks to the rate of change problem, yeah. No, and I, I, I can add to that, that, you know, Kozelek, uh, in, in many places in, in Neuzeit and in other, for example, take this famous kind of uh, description of uh, what happens to revolution, which uh, enters politics as it kind of exits the, the uh, circulation of, of seasons. But uh, again, like with the tree uh, that Lucia started us off with, it's a post seasonal in, or it could be uh, a post natural temporality also in the sense of extending rather than just breaking with. So I think this kind of uh, Kozelekian um, uh, time and treatment of time is, is very fruitful. Uh, and, and we should all kind of revisit and, and uh, excavate uh, uh, his, his writings for, for these uh, bridges between uh, the natural, or, you know, the, the, uh, the human and the planetary, which, uh, which Dipesh Chakrabarty uh, asynchronizes in, in, in an unfortunate way. One thing that's interesting is that we've seen several examples so far today of an architecture which wants, which calls for an interpretation of accumulation, of material accumulation. Certainly this was true of Atea's uh, shell buildings, which are 
shells and therefore appropriate for just storage of piles of stuff, right? You don't need an architecture. If you need to store piles of stuff, you can either make a cylinder where it adopts the volume or you could just make a pile and you put a roof on top. And that this was very quickly imported into the same kind of diagram as the geology, but it wasn't geology, it was the market. It was the fluctuation of the price of grain. So th there's ways in which the, um, I think architecture gets, at least in the hundred year period in which we're describing things, the architecture of re reinforced concrete gets put in the service of either visualizing a cumulative temporality or not. And I think, uh, Reinhold, this would make it very different from steel. Like steel would be uh, the standard object that gets you know multiplied and sent and is self similar everywhere it goes, as opposed to except in the case of the Statue of Liberty, of course, which is not self similar. But uh, but in the case of concrete, you really uh, give the designer the opportunity to either represent a cumulative notion of time, one where time temporal passage is represented as material accretion or not. But this would seem to make it, you know the last hundred years very di different, let's say, than the years before. Mm -hmm. And it's, it strikes me that this also makes it very different from the Anthropocene where we're, so that would be, I guess I would want to know from own, do we let that enter the sheer material visualization of the temporal accumulation? Do we let that enter or be one of the entry points into the Anthropocene or do we just say, well, this is a sort of ideological, you know, scrim that architects are telling themselves? Uh, you know, in order to represent dominant temporal modes. Are, are those necessarily separate? Ah, okay, good. Touche, good, yes. So the architectural indices of entry point, architects are en designing entry points into the Anthropocene. Yeah, you know, what, one of the things, the reason I was asking about the, the so-called so great acceleration though, I, I know many reasons, but, but one would be to think about how we think about periodization. Um, I, I think this conversation is help, helping in that, including the, the discussion you just, just were having, Sophia and on about Koselik, um, rather than as you know, compartmentalization or some sort of mechanical uh, stepping from one, one um, time zone to another in, in a way. Uh, and more like a kind of pulsation uh, or of, uh, of rates of change, of, of stasis, of, of, um, uh, of force. So uh, for example, in, in the um, you know, now canonical early scientific articles that define these things like Anthropocene and, and, and Great Acceleration, uh, I think it's in the Stefan Kritzen literature somewhere, I forget. Uh, they, they have all these graphs, it's like 16 or 18 little graphs. They all look the same, they all go like this. Um, and many of them make a lot of sense and correlate in, in, in terms of you know, deforestation and, or whatever, I mean, uh, ecosystem loss, et cetera. But then, then one of them has to do with the number of McDonald's that there are in the world. Uh, and and, and it's, it's, first of all, it's striking to me, this is and the flip side of the discussion about beauty the other day, uh, at the other panel. Uh, the, 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 the degree to which something that seems utterly extrinsic and uh, you know, extra scientific in, in a sense to this conversation is necessary, or at least judge a useful placeholder for, for something else that is not captured in the, in the, other, the other graphs that are define uh, you know, uh, other more logical correlations. Now, it's not to say that this isn't logical, but the logic is different. Um, so, so that's, it's kind of in that spirit that I'm kind of asking about the steel concrete dialectic, that, that if we, would the hundred years and or would the pulsation, you know, because what does it look the same from that point of view when you, when you discuss other, other, when it, the whole, this whole discussion is refracted through other material complexes? Um, is the common denominator still going to be coal? Probably in, in most cases. Uh, does it matter if it if there is some sort of subtle inflection uh, in terms of the energetics and or uh, the the natural history uh, of these materials, um, you know, uh, for the bigger picture that we're we're collectively trying to paint? I don't know, Lucia, you're 
Yeah, that's Smart. a great point. I just thinking, I think the McDonald's is the steel model. It's the consumptive model. The reason they have that probably. Yeah, it, it stands to for. Tied to, tie to consumption, to tied to mm -hmm. an idea that we all eat the same thing and whatever. And so indeed the idea that steel goes everywhere paints a picture of architects and designers as consumers of a product that comes to them, as opposed to the concrete mode, which is one where, although we have just been describing for now two conferences that it does take an industry to make the cement and that's extractive and it, it attracts monopoly and, and everything. There is a market for it, there's control. Still the person building their concrete home at home with steel found on the ground considers themselves not to be a consumer, but to be a builder of something. So those would seem like when I was thinking whether the tree model is being subsumed under this or whether it's, you know, whether as you said, it concrete is an extension of the tree. The tree model that we would have to have now is that any tree that you take to build something, you have to imagine that you're gonna, somebody's gonna plant another tree in order for the for the exchange to work. So to me, the, the concrete extension um, works slightly better than the, like to me, Reinhold, the steel is the McDonald's. Yeah, yeah. But uh, but I want I want to add I want to do to McDonald's what I tried to do to to time uh, of of coal and uh, and concrete because I think this kind of uh, infatuation with McDonald's has its roots in the Benjamin Barber kind of uh, world versus jihad. Yeah, McWorld, right, uh, right. Which yeah. which your colleague uh, Timothy Mitchell uh, inflected with the notion of Mac Jihad. Right. Uh, right. In other words, you know. Uh, uh, Mac McDonald's branches couldn't be more different in, in right. different places in the world. Yeah. In many of them, you can buy meat, right. uh, which is the, the, the reason they would be on one of these hockey sticks. So, right. uh, so I think we need to kind of pluralize McDonald's as much as we, as, as, as you know, exactly like we need to pluralize concrete and, uh, uh, and, and coal and, and so on and so forth. Um, and the other thing, the other thought, uh, Apropos what you're saying, Ryan, was about for about the great acceleration, and that's why I uh, mentioned this uh, this joke by uh, David Wallace Wells. Uh, maybe uh, 1945 isn't late enough. Maybe we need to kind of look at what's happening in the 1990s. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So, uh, so, so, so we we can't really choose. Uh, it's also mm -hmm. a question of responsibility, right? Uh, we can't kind of uh, excuse from responsibility uh, those uh, political actors who would find it more comfortable to, to begin the conversation on, or the Anthropocene in, in one point or, or the other. It's, it's all of the above, I think. Yeah. Well, one way that we, to think about that is that the, the tendency, especially in our field, the architecture and its allied fields, to want to quantify things that have to do with the earth you know, deforestation, to quantify that and to tie that to periodization is very strong. Um, and we've been doing it now. We're doing it in our paper and, and Reinhold just did it with steel. Um, and it sounds like you're calling in a way on for quantification of just more human phenomena, which would inevitably lead to the diversification. And even the theorists of the mm -hmm. Great Acceleration have done this. They have said, well, there was a Great Acceleration, although you can still find places in which you would have had made your own, you know, made and had your own breakfast or something like that. So it mm -hmm. sounds like just the sheer um, emphasis on the human diverse uh, phenomena, uh, sort of reception of these material phenomena, um, mm -hmm. would would do that. Mm -hmm. But I think there's well, still one oh, kind. Right. Good. Well, I was just going to say in, in in the there are humans and there are humans and then and and the the um in the spirit of differentiation and 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 you know and we would we want to begin by recognizing with that differentiation comes struggle i read that to be you know more than between the lines on uh, of your point about labor in in the very beginning there um so What's interesting to me about, about how we periodize, this is a little bit analogous to the Kaselik. What Kaselik does, who, a, a decidedly anti-revolutionary historian, you know, this is somebody who's writing in a sense against uh, those historiographical traditions that, that want to, in one way or another, remember the revolution, um, even if it's 
you know, in its failures, um, the uh, the um, war, uh, you know, another name for the Great Acceleration, especially with architectural historians, because reconstruction after the Second World War is so important in 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 spreading, you know, in kind of the 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 um, growth of, of various modernist idioms and and so on. Uh, that we could just call it post-war, um, and and that is would is in some sense a Mumfordian characterization as well, to the extent that Mumford is a kind of historian uh, or thinker uh, who, who 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 spends time with the implements of war as to some extent um, generative or productive of human relations and as well as reflective of of these kinds of struggles. And so, if we replace the struggles. The, the, or, or supplement, let's not say replace, but supplement the conflicts that come with Anthropocene thinking, which I think, you know, I don't know if we're agreeing on this, but I, I, my sense is that Chakrabarty shies away a little bit from this when he drifts towards natural history. He leaves behind some subaltern studies, good solid Gramscian, you know, kind of he counter hegemonic thinking, um, is, um, is to, uh, to ask, you know, how does what we call post-war look different uh, when thought of as, in the, on the one hand, as continuous uh, with this hundred year history that you're trying to lay out. It's just war by other means. In other words, concrete is war by other means after the, after the war, when you're thinking, when you're counting the carbon. Um, and, and or discontinuous in terms of what, what, you know, either accelerates and or changes in other in other ways. Uh, so, th because that's, this is for historians, especially for those of us who deal with the built environment, uh, a regular, it's almost a cliche that the various wars, you know, interrupt construction and they produce new technologies and therefore, you know. Yeah, but there are ev events and moments maybe events, relative yeah. to the material, to the plots, the, the many plots of the accelerations, most of those accelerations don't register these individual events or revolutions. And so the question is how does something that spans the, the century enact a revolution when it's, although seemingly a great acceleration, relatively slow compared to most things that cause revolutions, I would argue. But uh, <laughs> I guess what, we, the, we do the have a question. I in, what, what's that? Uh, I'm just following you guys leading. Uh, if Owen wants to meanwhile respond, we yeah. have a question in the chat. No, I was just oh, going to frame I, that as a question in the context of uh, how do we how do we situate that in the uh, modern evolution of well, the Great Acceleration is one term, but the positivist framework of sustainability and the 1990 Earth Summit and how we've tried to create, you know, Donella Meadows and systems theory about how, can we model all these complex things and are there ways to be reactive to all these dynamics of dynamics? And part of me says no, but I think rhetorically we have to say yes, I guess. I mean, that's what I'm wondering uh, in the context of the different time frames on you've presented whether we have a strong way to, to claim there should be a change and a shift in thinking right because generally i don't see where in history we have made a significant change in behavior due to such a slow and incessant shift in in the underlying uh driving mechanisms that would cause the change i guess mm. Like even for coal, like the fact that coal is still used, right? There's so many reasons it shouldn't be. And you've plotted out this wonderful history of how it continues to be. Um, and I think that within that, that hybridizing that with uh, um, these rede redefining timescales and recognizing what is a rapid rate of change, I think is where there maybe is a pathway to a different kind of argumentation. Um, but I don't know if you would agree. I mean, I, I, I don't have an answer. I have a, a way to kind of make the, the story more complex because I think what, what the, the temporal conundrum that uh, we're uh, alluding to uh, is also relevant to how we think of energy. So uh, coal is on the rise uh, in, total, uh, in total sums of, uh, of emission, but uh, on the rapid decline as kind of uh, as part of the pie. Uh, so I, I think the abstraction of energy and this kind of dual nature of how we think of energy 
uh, and the introduction of statistics to our thinking of energy is very similar to what uh, to, to to how we think of time, uh, and and I think this is uh, one of the ways that uh, or one of the junctions that uh, that that your concrete is kind of uh, raising. Yeah, that's that's very helpful, actually. One of the most um, humbling parts of this project for me um, and working with Forrest is, has been to notice how much the um, narratives given by popular history make it into the presentations of scientists, scientists who are quantifying time in a legitimately precise way, even whether they're talking about millennia or whether they're talking about their experimental you know, increments, uh, inevitably, some large scale periodization that a historian has made <laughs> makes it into the introductory paragraph. Uh, since the dawn of time, pyramids have done this. And, and as the architectural historian who uh, is taught to disclaim that they are not a scientist, that they only are telling narratives, um, and that insofar as they talk about centuries, those are not exactly 100 years, of course. It's a, it's a very humbling problem to encounter. Uh, how does one change what, the way one tells uh, history when faced with historians, with scientists who would very gladly change how they talk about periodization and correlate their own uh, timekeeping, very precise timekeeping to some larger narrative. So the way you just described it on was very helpful, which was that it seems like accounting and risk um, and energy go together. And, and this is the story of 100 years of concrete is, of course, not really about 100 years. It's not really about geological time. It's about the advent of this um, probab probabilization in all forms of ways in timekeeping and in also construction. Let's say to dumb yeah. it down super, you know, to the lowest level. I yeah, see exactly. And, I know, and as an engineer, I'll just confirm that I would be 100% in as a believer in time driving everything, but it's exactly that kind of narrative to rethink how the steam engine and energy is actually feeding back and changing that where perspective can help, you know, technical thinkers also reimagine what the problem really they're working on is and what the driving forces are. I think that's equally important to the historian recognizing sort of how technologists are leveraging the history itself. So, I mean, to, I think that's what, um, you know, Lewis Mumford, when he said the clock is what matters, he's trying to account for probability. He's trying to account for those managers who are using clocks to decide whether how the built environment is made. And I think your, re, your retort, which is actually the steamship did that work. The, the, the steam engine coal did that work, but it's still a time of temporal probabilization. I see that Sophia has written in the chat. Yeah, yeah. Periodization is a parallel process in geological timelines and socio-cultural divisions. Mm -hmm. Yes, excellent. Um, okay, so I will invite our panelists. Uh, Sophia, that will count as your parting thought. <laughs> <laughs> or feel free to jump on with another one, everybody. Or, or if you want to give live an uh, alternate parting thoughts. And I will yes, the all, marathon you, Zoom is coming close to it. Thank you all so much for your um, amazing talk and for you know being such a good intellectual companion all this time and in, in this particular instance and mm -hmm. thank you to all of our panelists thank you reinhold for joining us in the mm -hmm. in the concluding and thank you to everybody who's staying up late to <laughs> be with us so any concluding thoughts from our participants we should let people go it's friday mm -hmm. um i really um it's very hard to be part of a conference where the modes of of research and of data pr presentation um, are so different and people are coming from such different uh, places, but I thought that we did have some threads. Um, so I don't know, I'm pretty pleased uh, mm -hmm. at least with the number of questions that are unresolved that cohere as unresolved questions. Uh, please just jump in if you have any parting thoughts. Yeah, any thoughts? Um, but I'm sure everybody doesn't want to start a whole new debate. <laughs> Or we could just thank you all. Yes, we could just thank you. So um, everybody, we'll, give, we'll give them a moment of silence in case somebody has a really burning thought they want to. And it better be burning. <laughs> Besides, happy Friday. Okay. All right, in the absence. All right. Well, in that case, I get to thank Lucia for putting up with me, I guess. Oh. Um, and to all of you for also enduring the long Friday of presentations. It was wonderful. I, again, 
can't imagine it coming together better. And everybody did a wonderful job of responding to each other. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank we you know. really, now we have to rewrite the paper. We can't take the paper away. Also to the audience, our paper's coming out in a volume edited by Aggregates, which is titled yeah. Evidence, Narrative, and Architectural History. Unfortunately, it won't have any of the changes that we would make now that we oh, know. Yes. <laughs> Particularly after presenting it this morning, we're realizing that we're re-saying some of the things that we learned that needed to be modified more from the last conference. But, but we appreciate I, everybody's comments and, the, or, and responses to some of the points we're trying to bring forward. Yeah, this is the brilliance of having an ongoing project. And um, yeah. we, so we will, there will be a YouTube video of this uh, event. And then we will, we also have a link to the Vimeo, which was the Princeton event. And we hope to reconnect with everybody on the other side um thank you and have a good friday afternoon or night i hope yes i think it's late weekend. enough and don't forget uh your mothers and to, to lola who's you know braving this about to become a mother uh happy mother's day to all the mothers out there 